Okay, let's try another OCHEM practice exam. So we've got this transformation here, and we want to figure out what kind of reagents are going to achieve it. So this is an interesting one. Uh, if you look too quickly, uh, you might be convinced that you just want to do uh, Antimarkovnikov uh, hydrobromination, but check this out. We've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six carbons across there. One, two, three, four, five carbons across there. So we lost a carbon, right? So we lost this carbon. So we, we've got to cleave this pi bond. So we don't want to look at this and just go, oh, anti-Markovnikov hydrohalogenation, we got it. That's not going to work. We've got to lose a carbon. So what, what methods do we know that will allow us to cleave this pi bond? Well, certainly we could do uh, ozonolysis. And then let's just uh, let's just say we're going to do reductive workup to keep things simple. Uh, so that's going to be the dimethyl sulfide. And if we do that, uh, that is going to give us this. That'll give us uh, this aldehyde. Right. So we've got the aldehyde. We also made formaldehyde. Right, that would be uh, this carbon here. So uh, this carbon became formaldehyde, but we don't care about formaldehyde. We've got this. So now we have uh, the correct number of carbons. Right, we have got uh, right, one, two, three, four, five carbons across. That's the number of carbon. We've got the right number of carbons for our product. So now we can just transform functional groups. How are we going to get from the aldehyde to the alkyl bromide? Well, for, first let's reduce, right? I think re reduction is probably a good idea, right? We want to get rid of that carbonyl. If we go to the hydroxyl, maybe we'll have another idea. So let's reduce that down to the primary alcohol. So there's our primary alcohol. And then what reagent do we know that will take us from the alcohol to the alkyl bromide? That would be PBR3. So PBR3 will transform hydroxyl to uh, alkyl bromide. So this was just one to be careful. We had to ma make sure that we saw that we are losing a carbon. So we were not doing an addition reaction. So we had to do ozonolysis to cleave that pi bond, get rid of one of the carbons. Then with the aldehyde that remains, we reduced. And then we used PBR3 to get the uh, alkyl bromide product. So that's a, that's a pretty good one there. Okay, next, uh, which of the following cations is resonance stabilized? So if it's resonance stabilized, we have to have pi electron density that can be delocalized to produce different resonance structures. So this one is actually pretty obvious. This is the only, uh, this is the only one that can do resonance, right? We can draw another resonance structure there. If we push that pi bond over there, we can get a different resonance structure put the cation there. So these are the two resonance structures and that will be the answer, right? This one, this pi bond has no access. This is too far. It's too far away to do resonance. And here we don't even have any pi electrons. So that clearly doesn't make any sense. So that's going to be the one there. Okay. The conjugate base of H2SO4 has a negative charge delocalized over and we got some options with oxygen atoms. So let's draw uh, H2SO4. Right? We do need to know that this is the structure of sulfuric acid. Sulfur has six valence electrons, so it is, uh, and it can expand its octet because it has access to d orbitals. So uh, it can, uh, it, where this is, uh, sulfur can make six bonds. This is what sulfuric acid looks like. So what does the conjugate base look like? We're gonna, if we lose one of those uh, protons we are going to end up with this. So how much resonance is there? Well, we can push this up there and we can also push this down here, but we are not going to make it over there, right? This oxygen is not going to be, we don't have another pi bond there for anything to happen. So we've, uh, how many uh, oxygen atoms is the negative charge delocalized over? That would be this one and this one and this one. We can draw three different resonance structures that put the negative charge on these three different oxygen atoms, but we're not going to get it over there. So that is going to be three oxygen atoms. Okay, next, the free radical bromination of N-butane with molecular bromine and ultraviolet light. And then we've got some options here. So what are we doing? We've got N-butane, right? We've got but uh, straight chain butane, butane and we're uh, doing free radical bromination. So what does that mean? That just means we're going to stick a bromine atom on there. So we have two possible products, 
right? We're either going to get, well, we have two possible structural products, we should say. We're either going to get the secondary one or we're going to get the primary one. Okay, and so what we need to understand, number one, and if, if this is unclear, uh, you can always go back to my tutorial on free radical halogenation so you can see the mechanism uh, written out explicitly. We need to be able to know how this mechanism works. But long story short, we know that bromine radicals are quite regioselective, and uh, they are going to prefer to form, uh, th this reaction is going to prefer to form the more substituted alkyl bromide. So we're not going to go this way. We're going to get very little of the primary alkyl bromide. We're going to get predominantly secondary alkyl bromide. But the, the key thing to understand is that the intermediate is, uh, is a carbon radical. And a carbon radical, just like a carbocation, is planar. And so an incoming nucleophile can approach from either side, and therefore there cannot be any stereoselectivity, or in this case, enantioselectivity. So this, this reaction is non-enantioselective, but it is partially regioselective. What that means is that we're going to get a racemic mixture, we're going to get a racemate, we're going to get half R, half S, of our secondary alkyl bromide, but we are going to get predominantly the secondary and not the ter not the primary. So it was highly regioselective, but it was not stereoselective or enantioselective. We get the racemic mixture. So that's what we need to know about uh, free radical halogenation. Okay, next, which reaction often yields product mixtures due to rearrangements? So the rearrangements can only occur when we have uh, when we have say. Uh, uh, well, first, you need a carbocation. So when you have a secondary carbocation adjacent to a tertiary or a quaternary carbon, you can get carbocation rearrangements. You're going to get a mixture of products. It gets a little messy. And you have to have a carbocation intermediate to do it. And so SN1 is the only one that has a carbocation intermediate. SN2 and E2 are concerted reactions. There is no uh, intermediate at all. It is just one step uh, transition state product. So uh, that's clearly going to be SN1 there. Okay, which of the following compounds is most acidic? So we have, uh, we have, uh, how can we draw this? We've got, let's draw this with circles. Let's say we've got O right there, uh, and then we've got uh, S is a little bigger, and then we've got uh, selenium is bigger still, right? These are all analogs of one another. These are straight down group six. Uh, we write oxygen, sulfur, selenium. Those are right. Uh, they're they're analogs of one another, so they behave similarly similarly chemically. Uh, but so which of, which is the most acidic? Well, that is the one that right. Uh, acidity is proportional to the stability of the conjugate base. So when we're asking about which one is the most acidic, what we're really asking is which one has the most stable conjugate base. And all of these will end up with an anion that is localized on the central atom. And the larger the central atom is, the better it can accommodate that negative charge. It can diffuse it around a larger volume. And so the selenium atom is going to be best able to accommodate the negative charge. Therefore, hydrogen selenide is the strongest acid. So that's about uh, atomic size right there. Okay, let's do another nomenclature. Uh, so, got to get the longest carbon chain. This one we got to look at. We got to be careful. Get the longest carbon chain. That is going to be this. We got to go all the way over here. And now we have to number it. So, how are we going to number this thing? Uh, do we want to go right to left or left to right? Well, over here, one, two, three, four, five, we don't have a substituent until carbon five. Over here, one, two, three, we have a substituent on carbon three. So, let's go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we have a decane, right? This is a decane. And then what else we have? We've got a methyl on carbon three. We've got a propyl on carbon five. That is a three carbon substituent. And we've got an ethyl on carbon six. So we've got to uh, list these in alphabetical order. So ethyl comes first, E before M before P, L-M-N-O-P. So we got to list ethyl, then methyl, then propyl. So let's go ahead and do that. We've got six ethyl, three methyl, five propyl decane. 
6-ethyl-3-methyl-5-propyl decane. So that's a pretty straightforward one. And then now let's do this one. Draw the two possible chair conformations of the following tetra-substituted cyclohexanes. We've got cyclohexane, four groups on it, and we want both of the chairs, right? We've got to have both of the chairs. So how are we going to do this? Uh, let us draw one chair. And let's draw the other chair. So that looks pretty reasonable. Uh, and now when you place the first substituent on there, it is arbitrary. Uh, we can put one of them anywhere we want, and then we just draw the others with respect to that. So I'm going to arbitrarily choose this to be the rightmost carbon. And so over here, the rightmost carbon, I've got an ethyl group going up, which in this case is the axial position, and then a methyl going down. Now I'm going to go two clockwise, and I've got an ethyl going down. So that looks like that. And then the other way, I've got an ethyl going down, so that looks like that. Let's make that a little more clear. Ethyl like that. So uh, that's one of them. And now when we flip it, we have to make sure that everything is on the right carbon. So if this is the rightmost carbon here, this is the rightmost carbon here. These substituents better still be here. So on this one, we've got an ethyl going up. Now that is the equatorial position. And we've got a methyl going down in the axial position. Now let's go two clockwise. So here's two clockwise here. We had an ethyl going down. There's the ethyl going down on the, uh, on the uh, axial position. And then going the other way, we had an ethyl going down here. So we better have an ethyl going down here. So students sometimes have a hard time with the chair flip. But remember, all it is is each carbon is getting pushed up or down. So it's not spinning or flipping or anything like that. It's just this carbon got pushed up. These two got pushed down. These two got pushed up. This one gets pushed down. So if you have trouble, all, you can even number them. Just start leftmost and number clockwise or something like that. The leftmost will remain leftmost. The rightmost will remain rightmost. So this carbon is this carbon. We do have to understand that this carbon is this carbon. And we have to understand that this carbon is this carbon. So that if that is giving you trouble, check out my cyclohexane uh, chair confirmation tutorial to learn a little bit more about the chair flip. We do have to absolutely master that. So now we want to know, so these are the two correct chair confirmations. Now we want to know which one is more stable. So over here, we've got uh, ethyl equatorial, ethyl equatorial. Uh, methyl equatorial and ethyl axial. So we have equatorial, 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 axial. Over here, we've got ethyl axial, ethyl axial. These two ethyls are axial. Uh, and then we have, uh, we have, uh, uh, another, uh, well, actually, all three uh, ethyls. Wait, this one, let me just make sure. Uh, ethyl equatorial, ethyl equatorial, uh, ethyl axial, methyl equatorial. Over here, we have ethyl axial, ethyl axial, uh, ethyl equatorial, methyl axial. And so we've got how many equatorials? We've got just one equatorial, and then we've got three axials. So this is very clear, right? It's very obvious which one is the more stable one. It is the one with three equatorial groups, right? We've got only one axial ethyl group right there. Then we've got equatorial, equatorial, equatorial. So that's clearly uh, the, the better one. And then it's asked for all sources of strain. The sources of strain are just the uh, diaxial interactions that the ethyl is participating in with these uh, protons right there. So uh, that is a little bit about cyclohexane chair confirmations, and that's the end of this exam. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.